too nervous, very dreadfully nervous I have been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed them, not dulled them. Above all is the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in earth. I heard many things in hell. How, then, am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. Isn't it, possible to, it isn't possible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object? There was none. Passion? There was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desires. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and by so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now at this point you fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I made an opening sufficient enough for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed that no light shone out. Then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole body within the opening so far, and I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when, he, when my head was well into the room, I did the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye, and this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I always found the eye closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. It was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning before day broke, I went boldly into his chambers. I spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a haughty tone, and inquiring how he'd passed the night. So you see, he would have been very profound, old man, indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. I watched his minute hand move more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagery. I could scarcely contain my feeling of triumph. Think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and not in he not even dreaming of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me. For he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. No, you think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as the pits with thick darkness, for the shutters were closed and fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see me opening the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily, steadily. I hid my head in, and was just about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening. And the old man sprang up in bed, crying, Who is it? The cook was quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I didn't move a muscle. In the meantime, I didn't hear him lie down. He was still sitting in the bed, listening, just as I had done night after night, hearkening to the death watchers in the walls. Presently, I heard a silent groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not the groan of pain or grief, oh no, it was a low striped sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo, the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well, I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he turned in his bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy himself careless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, well, it's nothing but the wind in your chimney. It's only a mouse crossing the floor. I hear it is merely a cricket that has made a single chirp. 
Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these superstitions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain because death, in approaching him, had stalked him with his black shadow before, and enveloped the victim. It was a mournful influence, the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither heard nor saw me, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it, you cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out and conceived to fall upon the, eye, the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open. I grew furious as I gazed on it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all the dull blue, the hideous veil over it that chilled the very moil in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you what you mistake for madness is but an over-acuteness of the senses? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as which, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart, and increased my fury as the beating of a war drum stimulates a soldier to courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meanwhile, the hellish, the hellish, meanwhile, the hellish tempo of the heart increased. It grew louder and quicker and quicker every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dreadful hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of the old house, so strange a noise as to excite me to an uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the greeting grew louder, louder. I thought his heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by the neighbors. The old man's hour had come, and with a loud yell, I threw the lantern open and leaped upon the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. However, this did not vex me. It would not be heard through the walls. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the coil. Yes, he was stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. The eye would trouble me no more. And if he still think me mad, he would think so no longer when I described with wise precautions I took to concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hesitantly, but in silence. Most of all, I dismembered the corpse and cut off the head and arms and legs. I then took the three planks from the floor of the chamber and disposed all between the scaffoldings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stains of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been so careful for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I to fear now? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect civilry as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicious of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been dispatched to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? It was a gentleman's welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bid them search. Search well. I led them at length to his chambers. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. and enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought in chairs into the room and desired them to rest here from their fatigue. While well, I myself, in wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of my victim. The officers were satisfied with my 
The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singly at ease. They sat, and I, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of family things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My heart ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and chatted. The room became more and more distinct, continued to become it more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of it, this feeling, but it continued to grow in distinctness, until, at length, I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a higher tone. Yet, the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a sound as which a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I rose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gestations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I had placed the f I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to a fury by the observance of the fan. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I waved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all. It continued to increase. It grew louder, louder, louder. I say, and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it? Almighty oh, God, no, no, they heard. They suspected, they knew, they were making a mockery of me. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than their dis disillusion. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt them a scream or die. And again, hark louder, 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 still louder. Villains, I shriek, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, tear up the planks and hear, hear. It is the beating of his hideous. Hoyt.